There we go. So there's some people here that weren't at the last meeting. So I'm going to just ask we'll go around again and introduce ourselves, tell us who we who you represent, um, and uh, and go from there. So we'll start over here with Representative uh, the Honorable Petabrami. Thank you, uh, Pat Abrami from uh, Stratum, uh, former state rep for six terms. Uh, I was on Ways and Means all that time, very familiar with this the issue of charitable gaming. And uh, thank you. Yep, yeah, Norman Roberge, again, Concord Lions Club, representing the charitable gaming sponsors, if you want, other uh, activities. Uh, good morning, everyone. Charlie McIntyre, I'm the director of the Hampshire Lottery. Uh, Senator Lou Dallasiva, representing District 20 in Manchester. I'm fairly familiar with uh, gaming over the years here in New Hampshire. Representative Joe Sweeney from Salem. Uh, I'm new to the committee, so it's exciting to be here with all of you to, to work on our gaming laws and study the recent changes to it. Uh, as I said, represent Salem, which is a town with a proud history of supporting gaming uh, in, our, in our sweepstakes and lottery, so excited to be here. Thank you. I'm D I'm Representative Dick Ames. I'm uh, from Jaffrey. I'm in my eleventh year in in the House, and uh, I uh, chaired an earlier commission on uh, on gaming way back whenever eight years ago, nine years, ten years ago, maybe. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Fred Doucette. Uh, Familiar theme will be heard here. I'm also serving out of Salem. I'm in my fifth term, and I also serve on Ways and Means. Great, and I'm Senator Tim Lang. I am uh, a four-term legislator serving three terms in the House. Uh, I served all three terms. I was on the Ways and Means Committee as well as I'm currently the chair of the Ways and Means Committee um, for the Senate. Uh, and obviously, having seven years on Ways and Means, I'm pretty, pretty familiar with the charitable gaming laws. So that being said, we're going to move on to electing a new chair. Um, this is an organizational meeting um, to reform, and then upon electing a chair, um, we'll have a presentation from Lottery. One thing when we get to the presentation I'm hoping we'll do is we'll hold all questions while Charlie gets through his entire presentation and then ask questions so we don't interrupt them because we'll probably find it on a later slide. So, Representative Bami. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lang. Um, are you gonna, are we going to approve the minutes first? Uh, well, I was going to have the chair elected, but I can do that. So there's minutes presented for August 14th. Um, I'd entertain a motion the to reason adopt I, the minutes. Well, the reason I said I'm missing from the minutes as being present. Thank you. So, so we get a motion, then we can amend them. So okay. you move, move, move to the adopt, the, adopt the minutes. Is there a second to adopting the minutes? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the minutes. It sounds like we have at least one edit, and that is I was in a the member appointed by the governor. Yeah, the, so the, I don't fit in any of these other categories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So public member um, will add um, to the minutes. The public member Pat Abrami was present. 
any other edits or updates to the minutes. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The minutes are adopted. Uh, um, Senator, it's sort of a point of a question. Um, last time we didn't really sort of have an official minutes keeper. Mm -hmm. And somebody had to help the committee. Um, I had spoken last time about bringing some of the folks I work with mm -hmm. to help. And I brought somebody. I don't know, don't know if you've arranged for somebody to sort of act as an assistant. Or I, I, I brought somebody who works with me to do that if you. So I think the plan was for your person to do it. Uh, John, uh, Representative Janigian, is our official clerk. Okay. So once the minutes are taken, if you can forward them to him, and then he'll overview them and then sure. present them to the committee. She's with me here. I don't know if you want to sit with the table. Is an open seat? Yeah, she can sit at the end of the table. That'd oh. be great. So it's easier for her to take notes. Okay. Let me... Thank you. Yeah, and let me sure um, she's on her way up, probably wondering why I called her up like this. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the woman who gets, who gets the privilege or sad, sad event to work with me every day, uh, Kelly Crockett. So <clears throat> is it Kelly? Thank you, Kelly. Um, so next up is election of chair. Um, so I'll open the floor for nominations. Senator D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I nominate Pat Abrabi uh, for chair of the commission. And very briefly, I've served. Oh, let's hold on a second. Let's get a second, and then you can speak to the nomination. Good. It's been moved by Senator D'Alessandro, seconded by uh, Representative Doucette for Pat Abrabi. You want to speak to your nomination? If I might. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, I've known Pat Abrabi for a number of years and uh, know of his interest in this subject matter and the amount of time and effort that he has spent. Uh, in this in this arena i know i've been around this for the last 25 years and i, I he's been a good colleague i think knows knows uh, the business knows what what needs to be looked at and i think that could bring us a very objective opinion as, as to what the what the main what the main concerns are of the populace how to address those concerns and and how to address the charges that have been stated that, uh, under the missions of the commission uh, so with that, I uh, enthusiastically support uh, Pat Abrevi uh, for chairman. Thank you. So for further nominations, um, Chia? What, what, hold on, let me see if I can get a second for that before you get into it. I apologize. Seconded by uh, Representative Sweeney. Now you can speak to your nomination. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll jump to the vote. Um, we'll start with that. <laughs> Thank you. So do I. Thank you. Pat of Thank you. Now I'll vote for myself as well. So it's seven to five. Uh, Pat, you're going to be the chair. So again, take over the meeting from there for now, and then next I think that we need to 
we need to address all of those things. Um, when I chair, I chaired the Marijuana Commission years ago, um, we took a blank sheet of paper and we said, okay, if we were to do legalization of marijuana, what should it look like? I think that's what this commission should be doing. It's a new world. We should be looking at charitable gaming. I think we all support charitable gaming here. Uh, we want to see charitable gaming, uh, but we want to make sure that with the new landscape, that th the way we approach it is what we want as this group. And the final report of this will be a guide. Hopefully we create a guide for the legislature going forward as to what we want charitable gaming to look like. So this is a very important commission. Uh, again, we've grown up from a mom and pop operations to big time casino companies coming in. So uh, it's, it's just a moment in time that we need to pause and we need to address all the issues. And I do have a handout I'll give out later about that. So with that, um, Charlie, you're up. So if you look at your um, minutes, right, we outlined five charges. I'm not sure this is straight down. So very specific things in the bill. And I want to hear about the kind of appeals. And I would love to this voted on by the legislature just Right. Obviously, we're going to make sure we meet the five charters. Um, I think there's a lot of other issues that are going to arise, uh, and it's up to the group. If you think we're straying from the task, and then we won't go there. But I know in the Marijuana Commission, we went where it led us um, because it was an important issue. And we came up with 54 recommendations that were outside the bounds of that. So if you want to stay with these five things, fine. Some some of my issues may fall within these five or six, whatever it is, five. Um, but yeah, Lou. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think uh, all of us know that charitable gaming is here to stay. I don't think there's any question about that. It's how charitable gaming is run. Is charitable gaming fulfilling the rationale for charitable gaming? Are all of the players playing under the same rules? And are those rules being applied uniformly across the board? And indeed, is the security that we talk about being, being necessary for this to work, is that in place and is that functioning? Is that functioning? Charitable, charitable gaming has become a huge entity in, in, in our state. I think we have operating at the present time at least 12 casinos, at least 12. And I don't know how many others are under, uh, under preparation for, for opening at, at the present time. Uh, there was a time when proliferation was a real concern of the people of the state of New Hampshire and a real concern of the legislature. And obviously that's not a concern anymore. And as a result of that, I think uh, the landscape has changed. And as legislators, it's our job to make sure that the landscape is the landscape that we organized, we brought forward, and we legislated. And if that's not if that's not the case, then things have to be done to correct that. I served on the commission uh, a number a number of years ago, and we did enunciate a number of things that had to be taken care of. I think some of those have been, but some of those have not. So those are the things that we have to, I think we have to look at. This is an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility. Gaming, gaming is on television more than the damn news. Every, I mean, they're beating prescriptions. I'd say get your prescriptions at DraftKings. That's the place to go. There are more ads for gaming on television than anything else. It, it, to me, it's it's unbelievable. So uh, these, are, these are things that have happened over the last couple of years that, that really uh, are, are important, uh, very important. Uh, and what, what about the habitual gambler? Uh, what, what place is that in our society? And, and, where, and where's that going? I guess I've spoken too long, but thank you. But thank you, Mr. Chip. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Dick? Thank you. Um, 
Yes, I, I agree with uh, um, the uh, sentiment that uh, we need to look broadly. And I think that's, uh, that that need is, uh, if you look at these five bullet points, it becomes immediately evident whether the state should limit the number of charitable gaming locations. Uh, well, how do you answer that question? You, you need to dive deeply into uh, what the demand is, what the uh, other states have done in terms of limiting or not limiting uh, charitable gaming sites and, uh, and why they've done that and uh, how that affects revenue. And another one is whether more HHR licenses would increase reduced revenues to charities. Again, you've got to dive deeply to figure that one out. And uh, so I, I think we need to uh, look broadly in order to answer these questions. And I concur with Senator D'Alessandro that uh, this is a time where it's very important to do so. It's, it's, uh, the, New Hampshire is moving on, uh, on the gambling issue, and we need to make sure it's moving in a good direction. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Charlie, you're up. Uh, do you want to? You want to go up here so we can all see it? I have help, too. You have help, okay. Just have your other people introduce themselves. I will. If you would be so kind to not tell admin services that I use Colored Ink, I'd appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone. Once again, Charlie McIntyre, Director of the Hampshire Lottery. With me is Valerie King, who is head of our licensing, and John Conforti, who is the Lottery's Chief Compliance Officer. Uh, and they do this a lot more than I do, so I'll look, look to them to answer questions and go through this as you go through this presentation. But certainly, we'll start with the basics. I imagine this will be the first of many times that I or my colleagues will be sitting here uh, asking questions and, and, and the like. So I'll, you know, we'll start at the beginning and work our way forward. Obviously, the charities derive significant revenue from the operation of charitable gambling. One area we do not regulate, which has often come under um, question, is raffles. <clears throat> we have nothing to do with raffles. So the, if you have a raffle in a city or town, you seek permission from that city or town. Usually the police department um, permits you for a raffle held in that town, or sometimes you don't seek a permit and we don't know about it. So <clears throat> otherwise there are four areas essentially of charitable gambling that we regulate. Bingo, uh, Lucky Seven, which are, I mean, obviously I think everyone knows what bingo is. I certainly grew up helping bingo when I St. Anne's in Quincy. Um, Lucky seven are called pull tabs. Other names are also called break open or seal cards. These are cards you can buy that you break open and if you match, you win. Um, they are the comparator or the companion really to bingo games. You have to have a bingo license to sell Lucky seven tickets and they are the profit center for most charities that do run bingo. Bingo is actually loss leader. The Lucky seven tickets make money. A number of years ago, our predecessor agency, not ours, but the predecessor agency, Racing and Charitable Gambling, approved machines. What year was that? 15, 2015. 2015. And shortly after that, we were, they were merged with us and became one agency, essentially all gambling in the state and the Lottery Commission. 
<clears throat> Third area is games of chance, obviously, which are casino style games, and historic horse racing is the fourth. And we'll go through them one at a time. Val, you want to spread bingo? No, me yeah, sure. Um, so just to give you an overview of bingo, it's it's your traditional bingo. We don't do electronic bingo. It's it's all your traditional callers calling numbers at the um, local bingo halls. Um, they're they're generally held at commercial bingo halls, but they can also be held at um, locations owned by a charity, like a, a basement of a church or whatever. Um, they must be operated by the members of the organization. They can have assistance from licensed gaming consultants, but the charity is the one in charge and supposed to be operating the, the games. Um, the charitable organization retains all of the revenue that they generate with the exception of a 7% um, fee on carryover coverall and winner take all games, which this state collects. Um, as, as Charlie mentioned, bingo itself is a lost leader, which is why they often sell lucky seven tickets at their bingo events, because that's really where the money is made. And they have different fun little games, like Charlie mentioned, seal cards that help uh, generate most of their revenue. And that's the, the basics of bingo. Okay. Uh, second, obviously, lucky seven. And lucky seven, as it described, is sold in two ways. One is through paper, an actual physical ticket that is printed and sold in deal sizes. And the second is through a machine and is similarly sold in a deal, but is rendered electronically and printed on paper, but is not the primary way the, way the person finds out if they won or not. Um, the Lucky 7 tickets have a payout similar to what a scratch ticket would in terms of prize to the player. Um, the state receives a deal fee of $15 per deal of $3,600 tickets. 3,600 tickets, as you can imagine, this is not particularly, uh, what's our revenue from Lucky 7? Uh, for a deal? For you, for you. I think it's like $2, two, two, two million? About two million, about $2 million a year for, for Lucky 7, both um, physical as well as mechanical machines. Yep. Yeah, I just interject one thing. See, I just want to clarify. The Lucky Sevens used to be uh, only able to be sold in conjunction with bingo games, but um, the legislature did make a change, I believe, two years ago to allow it at Games of Chance facilities. Um, so there are a few Games of Chance facilities that have electronic Lucky Seven. Um, those are generally the facilities that do not have uh, historic horse racing. Um, and so obviously as historic horse racing has come on, it's replaced a lot of that electronic Lucky 7 um, uh, business. Uh, but it is still um, possible, and it does happen that uh, Lucky 7 sales do take place in Games of Chance facilities outside of a bingo license. <clears throat> Why don't you walk through Games of Chance? Here we go. Oh, it's a Uh, so, uh, Tim, do you have the emails of everybody on the commission? Yeah, so uh, you should be copied on a couple of emails that have everybody in, but I'll make, yeah, sure, you, I'll make sure you get them. So. Okay, because I was going to pass something around, but... Okay. No, I'll make sure okay. you get them. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, I know Kelly has them all, so we yeah. should... Be, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. So with, with Games of Chance, uh, as mentioned earlier, those are your casino style games, your blackjack, your poker, your roulette. Um, they're, technically, they can be operated by a charity, but it's really not feasible. So they're operated at Games of Chance halls, basically your casinos. We have approximately 14, 14. 14 licensed game rooms at this time. Um, each charity, in order to operate Games of Chance at, a, at one of these uh, facilities, you have to have a charity host charity. And each charity gets 10 game dates per year. Um, at, yeah, up to 10 game, yeah. game dates per year. The revenue that the, um, the room earns on that game night 
the charity gets 35% and the game operator retains 65%. However, the game operator can also charge rent um, on top. And, and so that reduces the charity's portion um, sometimes by a lot and sometimes not. Um, so, uh, and I, and I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. Right, so so the the state does take uh ten percent of the it's ten percent of house winnings is what the state tax is, unless it's a tournament, which it's three percent of the money put into the um into the tournament. And that's the last bullet. So and sort of lastly and the certainly one of the areas that's been focused for the last few months, uh, historic horse racing, which was approved during the last legislative session. Um, it is the replay in of priorly run horse races, randomized um, for display with an entertaining display um, for a player. Um, these exist, I think, in five states, I think it's five states around the U.S., none near us. The closest thing is Virginia. Um, Iowa, Arkansas has it too. Um, and right now, I think within the state, there are 1,500, 1,500, 1,400, 1,500 machines in the state. And so one so of the- What was that number again? But I think it's either 1,400 or 1,500. I can get you the exact number. But it changes daily, as you can imagine. Some come offline, some go online, some get repaired, some get moved. But how many how many facilities actually have them? So at this point, it's, yeah, it's ten facilities have them now, okay. and that number is growing. But to put it in context, if I could, because there's a certainly a perception when you're talking twelve, fifteen, sixteen. Um, Twin Rivers has thirty five hundred machines in it. So to put it in context, in terms of size it's still a fraction of as big as the one in Rhode Island at, at Twin Rivers. So it's not, there aren't 14 size Twin Rivers facilities in the state. There are, or 10. There are, all told, they don't equal half of what Twin Rivers has in terms of gaming machines. And I'm gonna call them gaming machines. People call them what they want, but the legislature called them historic horse racing machines. I think we can all agree they are gaming machines by the broad definition that our industry uses them. Um, and I don't, like the other words that we, we call them, so. Um, and so it's a maximum of 12% of the handle is taken out. I think right now it's running about 10. Yeah, it's just like yeah. Eight, right? yeah, exactly, about 10%. So of every dollar put in, 90 cents is coming back out as winnings to the player. The remaining 10 cents is left over. Um, there's a unit of measure in our business called win per unit per day. It's how much is left in, in the tail after a player is Played a bunch. One lost, one lost, one won, lost, lost. Um, and of that dollar that's in the till, for example, 75 cents goes to the operator. Uh, 16.25 cents goes to the Lottery Commission, and 8.75 is shared between the two charities that are hosting the events at that facility that night. Oh, I'm sorry. If I just plan, yeah, of course. Just um, because I, I led my boss astray. Uh, so I just checked the last time we did a census at the end of August, it was 1600 machines. Um, that's grown uh, since then. Um, as Charlie said, that will change literally day to day, certainly week to week. And so we do track that every month or so. So at this point, it's probably, as I said, last census was 1618 machines. Um, that'll probably be closer to 1800 the next time we do that. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Ruth. Um, one of the rules that we promulgated through jail car approval is that HHR revenue cannot exceed by more than 6.33 times uh, table revenue or the games of chance revenue. And that's for a very specific reason is because on games of chance revenue, the charity receives 35 cents in the dollar on historic horse racing revenue. They receive eight. 
Machines are far easier to run and manage. They are far easier and cheaper to regulate. They are cheaper to deal with. And so I, we didn't want a situation where the charities, which is the reason we're doing this, are, are held to a detriment because it's easier to have machines than it is to have dealers at tables and surveillance cameras and pit bosses and change of shifts and all that. And so we wanted to make sure that in any end, the, no, the charities would not lose out on this process, that uh, all the table games would go away and there'd be nothing but machines and buildings and the like. So um, those places have certain names, none of which are appealing. So that's the reason for that rule. Um, and if they do exceed that number, then half of the HHR revenue goes to the charities that night. It's not a disincentive. It's not a punishment. It's just meant that you probably should have spent more time promoting charitable gambling versus, you know, your profit line. Um, and obviously the breakage from that is earmark for problem gambling services. Um, one of the things I will be seeking this legislative session is a fix to that. Last year, the legislature budgeted $150,000 for problem gambling services. Breakage exceeded that by $38,000. Right now, our CFO is having connections because he has an extra $38,000 he doesn't know what to do with. It's meant to go for problem gambling services, but it can't because it's only budgeted $150,000, and we have $188,000 to send there. So it'll be a request next session to fix that part. Um, can we go through license requirements? Sure. Um, so the licensing requirements on slide seven, that's specific to games of chance and HHR only. Um, in order to have HHR, you have to be a game operator or employer. So the license requirements are number one for the game operator or employer itself, which is the game room, uh, the operator of the games. Um, these can be either, and th these are generally the entities. Um, and so we review the entity itself and anyone that they rely on financially for their support. Then the next group is going to be your primary and secondary game operators. And those requirements are basically that they have to be 18 years or older and they can't have a criminal background or that um, either a felon or a misdemeanor that involves um, deceit or theft. And then you have your charitable organizations. Um, they just have to show eligibility to be defined as a charitable organization under the statute, which is you have to be registered with Secretary of State for at least one year. You have to be registered with charitable trust if required by law. And um, what's the other one? Oh, and you have to have IRS tax exemption and, and be in, not be on their auto revocation list. You want me to go to the next one? Sure. So just to go through, um, in order to be a GOE, you have to have a suitability determination. And so basically we start by, um, the, the legislature gave us the authority to perform that work and then we send it to the AG's office for review and their um, overall approval. approval. So we begin by, um, we have the applicants, they have to fill out a multi-jurisdictional uh, form that gives us all their data and statistics and, and, and things that we need to look at. They have to undergo a criminal history check through the state police. Um, we also review all of their... We do their financial review. Oh, thank you. Um, a financial review of all their financial statements, um, any judgments or petitions that are against them in the courts, and then we review any denials or revocations they've had here or in any other state regarding gaming. Let me jump in. So, so certainly that effort is compiled. It takes many days, as you can imagine, to compile all that data. There's a, usually a back and forth between our staff as well as the operator who's applying for the license. Um, and that takes, and the process under the law has to happen within 90 days for HHR. And we usually, we usually take 45 days and the Attorney General usually takes 45 days at that time. So uh, it's an exhaustive process. Obviously you're, we're trying to 
dissuade, or dissuade, wrong word, stop folks from who would not be eligible to have a gaming license in any other state from having a gaming license in this state. Um, and then obviously after that, we submit our findings or recommendations to the Attorney General for his review. Once we get an approval from the AG's office, we also need to make sure that the room itself is ready to operate. So we'll do a site visit. We um, review all the internal controls, um, all of their documentation that they use in the game room, and we actually perform a site visit. We review their surveillance, um, their how they do their, their um, cash drops and whatnot. If they're all ready to operate, then we issue the license. <clears throat> On the next slide is merely just a sort of a graph to show you the flow of money on HHR revenue. And it's describing how um, it's essentially the split between the operator and the remainder to the state and to the charities. And the next slide is just a pie chart of revenue distribution to um, the state, the charities, and the operators and how that has changed over the last um, couple of years. The HHR revenue distribution, obviously, is if three quarters of the revenue is going to the operator, obviously the pie chart is gonna be, you know, 270 degrees of revenue to the operator. And so on the next chart is um, just the overall, rev it was requested last year, the overall, last meeting, the overall charitable gambling revenue in this state for FY23 is that pie chart. So it's $115 million of gaming revenue. I would also submit to you that based on our reading, the revenue is accelerating. Also, I would note that based on our fiscal note for HHR, the current HHR revenue is more than twice what we anticipated per machine. When we did our estimate for revenue for the HHR machines, we estimated, I think, yeah, 125 per machine, and I think it was 1,200 or 1,500 machines? Yeah. 1,500 machines. Right now, the machines are running around $270 per machine, which puts them in line with the facilities in Oxford and Twin Rivers in terms of profitability. I think... Twin Rivers is running around 290, and I think Oxford, I think, is 240. So it's between those two in terms of profitability. And the next slide is essentially a indication of the just the, sp the, sp the speed of growth of charitable gambling after HHR begins. It's a pretty self-explanatory slide, I think. Uh, the next slide is a breakdown of the charity revenue over the last four years. Going to the, the amount of money going to the charities, obviously it's increased as we've made steps to increase bet limits, increase facilities, increase obviously historic horse racing has a, had a large hand in that. And the final slide is the state's revenue for charitable gambling obviously it has increased. We originally had made an estimate that it would max out around $12 million a year for the state. I think that's gonna be significantly lower than we anticipated. So um, that is a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, and so I, I truly appreciate your saving your questions till now, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And obviously this is not an exhaustive study. This is very top level stuff. And we're gonna be digging on this, I imagine, Mr. Chairman, over the next year, point by point, area by area, and we're happy to do so. so Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Early on in the presentation during the bingo section, the highly contested and uh, bingo area, you mentioned it was a loss leader. Is it a loss leader due to market dynamics or is it state regulations leading to it being a loss leader? I would say that bingo is just not that popular. <laughs> yeah, I think as an age thing, I don't think teenagers are lining up for bingo or 20 year olds, you know, let's say 21 year olds, but yeah, yeah. The chair's got a question. Uh, I know when we did the bill, 
we wanted to try to protect the the uh, the charities that have been around for a while. Yeah. And we had a phase in uh, split was different and it was going to eventually become equal yes. to the new charities because there's two charities per. It, it's also correct they cannot open the doors unless there's two charities sponsoring that. Not correct. So on HHR, there are facilities. Oh, it's on HHR. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about HHR. Yeah. So um, how are we doing with that? Is it been a problem to do that split of the money? So, so I can address that. Um, it hasn't been an issue yet. We're still in the period where we are grandfathering in the existing charities, the charities that were there before HHR. So they're still getting uh, a, a greater share of the overall profits. The newer charities that are coming in are 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 not getting an equal share. Um, we are getting close to a place, a stabilization point where we've grown the pie by two. Uh, but we're not there yet. Um, and one thing that's actually complicating it a little bit is that um, with the bet limits on uh, games of chance uh, increasing as well, that's increased that number. So HHR has even further to catch up to sort right. of double that number. Right. Um, so we may get to a place here early in 24 where there is a slight reduction in the amount that an, any individual charity may get. Uh, because we haven't quite doubled the pie. We've come about, we're about probably at 1.7, 1.8. Now, HHR is still growing substantially, but I'm not sure if we're going to make up that gap completely by that time period. Okay, thank you. Yes, question over here. Gina? Hi, you know? I don't know if it's a question, but I will say with the previous legislation on HHR, they did the two charities, which we have charity partners that benefit and I'm very proud of it. I was excited to get two. There was a little flaw in my opinion in that legislation where it was only for charities that benefited in 2020. We closed down for three months in 2020. So I felt really bad that we had some charity partners that couldn't return for three months. And I did not want to, as an operator, my other side of the hat, Obviously, I'm on boards as well, but as an operator, I didn't feel right about picking winners versus losers. So we opted to pair the same tier charities together the entire year. So our charities actually make a little less than they made before as we expand. But for us as an operator, we decided to make it fair, have everybody split everything in half especially given that some of those charities didn't benefit for those three months. So they missed out. I didn't want them to miss out twice. Well, uh, and I would also like to comment a little back. It's a little complicated. On the pie chart for HHR, I know it looks like the operator gets all that, but they take on all the expense. You also have to make a deal with the machine manufacturers. The machines cost maybe 50000 a piece or you do a lease agreement and you have to pay the totalizer people as well. But those are like private agreements, so they're very hard to put on a pie chart. Well, the, the one thing you said though, was you made a decision to do something that I thought we had in statute or at the very least in the rules that said that we would phase in that. So that, that I'm a little concerned <laughs> about, about that, that we, we were gonna phase in um, the the legacy, we call them the legacy charities versus the new charities. You made a decision to make it equal from day one. Where are we with that? Mr. Chair, let me uh, see if I can try to explain the how that works and how an operator may choose to proceed as as um, Gate City has. Um, the, the charities are given designations. They're either a tier one or a tier two. Tier right. one were the, the grandfather charities, for lack of a better term. So if you are running a tier one and a tier two charity, the tier one gets a higher percentage of the overall profits from Games of Chance and HHR. Right. Um, there is a mechanism because we couldn't guarantee that there would always be a tier one or tier, tier two that you can operate with charities of the same tier. At that point, the charity allocation gets split in half. So if you could have two tier ones, two tier twos, um, I, you, what Gate City has done and, and some other operators have done as well to make things um, more evenly distributed is uh, run the same tier at the same time, which under the rules creates that 50-50. So that's really 
the operator's decision. Um, we have that mechanism in there to protect the charities if they if they so choose to run one and two together. But they certainly have the right and legally have the ability to operate the same tier at the same time if they if that's what they choose. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm gonna ask for maybe here a heck of a lot of paper if you want, or, or at least a access, okay, maybe to a website or something we can get. Can we have a full list of all the charities, okay, by operator, how much they're, you know, how much they're getting and how much the expenses are so that we can go over and kind of just... But by expenses, do you mean the expenses of the operator or the expenses that the ex operator charges the charity? The, the, the expenses that the charity is paying, that, that's reducing okay. that. So we know what the operator is charging the charity. We wouldn't... Yeah, yeah, we would be able to... Yeah, leave that to you. Okay, no, that would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think the committee would like to see those kind of numbers. Sure. Um, as to where we're at with the dollars, the real dollars. So. Yeah, of course. Um, Senator, Senator. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Charlie. With regard to the breakage, the the the, you know, the more play, the greater the breakage. Does all of the breakage go into this fund for, to for, to for charitable for uh, problem gambling? Because usually breakage is split. During the old there days, a, there was the breakage change, was yeah. always split. Yeah, there was a legislative change last session where all of it goes into problem gaming from... So 100% of the breakage goes. For HHR. For HHR, yes. For HHR, sure. So based on the play, I don't know what number you put in place, but that number is going to be exceeded dramatically. Well, yeah. So when we met, our estimate on breakage was based on our estimate on revenue and historic horse racing revenue has far exceeded what we estimated. So that's why there's more money in breakage. Right. And is that kept in a restricted fund? Uh, it's restricted fund, yeah. It's it's go for problem gambling, and like I said, it's the money's exceeded what's in the fund as approved by the the budget. Okay, thank you, Dick. Yeah, this is a question about licensing and uh, and historic horse racing. Um, I understand that game operator employer license is required <laughs> in order to run historic horse racing. Is there a an additional licensure or level of game operator employer license that uh, qualifies, uh, enables a uh, facility to run historic horse racing? And if the, if there is or isn't, uh, is there any fee associated with that uh, enhanced license status or additional license? Um, thank you, Representative. I'll um, I'll try to explain it as best I can. So the, in order to apply for a historic horse racing license, you need to have a game operator employer license. Um, and there are suitability determinations done at both levels. Um, the way that um, the law, or excuse me, the rules read right now, the historic horse racing um, suitability review has many more um, requirements um, that are put into the, into the rule terms of that multi-jurisdictional. Um, so the historic horse racing review is very in-depth um, and it's in addition to it's supplemental to the games of chance or game operator employer um, suitability review. So it is a separate application. It is a separate license. There is no um, license fee uh, for historic horse racing license. Um, there is a, a potential investigation fee um, and we have a right to be reimbursed up to, I believe, $50,000. $50, the uh, our experience on those is they, they come in, you know, much lower than that, usually between five and ten thousand uh, dollars. But that's the only fee associated with the application for the historic horse racing uh, license. So there's neither a license fee for the license itself, nor in some jurisdictions you pay a license fee per machine, and that's not the case either here. Okay, Senator Lang. So, Charlie, uh, well, uh, exactly, Mr. Director. So, again, could you kind of walk through gaming, right? So, what's the handle? What's GGR? We're going to hear all these as we go through this, and probably giving a base foundation. Some members would be helpful sure. to understanding how we get to 
the number that we start breaking apart into operators and that kind of thing. So maybe you can walk through that a little bit to give a little primer for people. Let's do that. <laughs> you can do that. What do you mean? <laughs> Um, if you're going to phrase the question, you want to know how the money. Should I put a dollar down, right? Sure. What does that What does that represent? How much of the How much kind of walk through what that dollar looks like? What the yeah. handle? <laughs> now, I know we have the handle. Oh. And have... Okay, I think I I think I understand your question. Yeah. Hopefully, I can I can do it. So let's uh, let's say you go and uh, let's use sports betting, although that's not charitable gaming, but that's probably that's what I'm most conversant with. But you put $100 on the Pats uh, this weekend. Uh, we would call that the handle. Um, so that's the amount of money actually bet. Um, it would not be a very good bet right now based on the way the Patriots <laughs> are playing. Um, so I'd advise against. But um, so they, uh, for us, we, may, we, we would be happy. So uh, when that $100 uh, goes uh, in, um, let's say you bet uh, Mac Jones to throw an interception. <laughs> um, and you've won, right? So we're going to pay those winnings out. Um, ultimately, what we're looking at in terms of uh, the accounting procedure is the money that comes into the house is the handle. Then there are prizes paid. That is the greatest expense that comes out. Um, what The difference between the money that comes into the house and the amount that gets paid out in prizes is usually called gross gaming revenue, or gaming revenue, we have, just to confuse you guys, you know, there, there's different terminology that's given based on different games. But for the most point, part, that's gross gaming revenue. So as Charlie says, that's the money in the till after, after the day, after the prizes are paid. Um, obviously, operators have expenses based on that. Um, and they have to pay whatever uh, revenue share or tax is associated with that. They have to pay the charities out of that money. Um, and so that's the smaller pie that you start slicing up in terms of taxes. And again, that takes care of the operator's overhead. Um, and then ultimately then they'll have a profit based on whatever is left over at the end of that. So hopefully those are sort of the different levels of accounting where things get broken up, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, I think you're about to say what I'm about to say. Go ahead. Can I just, we, so we created uh, a glossary of terms that we can hand out as well, sort of a, a primer on de definitions we use all day, every day, but certainly are not English to most people. So uh, we can, I can re create that for the next meeting and sort of you can, when we're talking about it, you'll know the right verbiage. It's kind of like, so we'll stick to, well, we'll use just table games again. So in a given night, the, the house will get a certain amount of handle. People have bought into games and, yeah. and do that. They have their winners and their losers. So they have all their winners and they pay out those winners and that comes off that handle that is played yeah. that night. So whatever Correct. the money is that night. And then from that handle, you have GGR, the gross gaming revenue, which is basically the net of what they have left over. Um, yeah. And then from that, the operators can do what? So well, they can, is it a straight split at that point? Or is there additional fees that come out before the split? It depends on the game as we've outlaid here in terms of what's retained, but we'll use historic race, racing, it's the cleanest. At the whatever's left in the drawer or the, the box at the end of the night, if it's a hundred dollars, they keep seventy five and pay their expenses and their employees. Twenty five gets sent to the other side of the house, and that's split two ways: mm -hmm. sixteen to the state, eight to the charity. Um, that's the split on that. That's the literally. Uh, one more. One yeah. more. So again, so relative to let's go the table games because we have this okay, rent yeah. issue, which is a specific tax charge to our committee to talk about. Yes. Um, so again, once we get the GGR, does rent come out off the top of that and then divide it, or is rent charged? How, how does that work? Rent is charged. Uh, so rent for games of chance is a flat fee um, that's contracted for before the game date. Um, so that is that is up to the charity and the game the game operator to negotiate. Um, it does vary from room to room, um, but that that's a flat rate. Now the only thing that is they, they cannot go negative, so a charity cannot owe money at the end of the day. So if there if the rent was five hundred dollars, but the charity only made four hundred dollars, uh, they can't lose that hundred dollars. The worst they could do is get zeroed out. And in operation, game operators ultimately will usually reduce rent if they have an unlucky night or an unlucky run um, to make the charities as whole as possible. 
So last question to make sure I'm clear on that. So rent doesn't come off TGR, it comes off the percentage the charity gets and they subtract it from that. C correct. And the the folks uh, John and Val work with confirm in each marketplace what a commercial reasonable rent would be to confirm that they're not being overcharged. Thank you. Uh, wasn't, isn't there in statute a, a maximum though? Is it 750 or is it, isn't there, a, is there a maximum? There, there, there is no maximum. The, the, really? What the statement in the law, and I'm paraphrasing somewhat, is that the only constraints are the fair market rental value for the property for any use. So it's not specific to gaming right. use. So, for example, if you could rent it out for a wedding at $1,000 a night, theoretically, you could charge $1,000 right. a night for, right. um, for, for gaming. Um, I just want to interject one other thing, too, since we're talking about the different levels of accounting here. And it's important for those who are not as familiar with gaming or coming into this a little bit newer, that handle is obviously always a very large number. Um, but in reality, that is not the money that walks into the facility. So for, you know, again, taking a, if you're sitting at an HHR and you're betting, you know, you're a hundred dollars, you put a hundred dollars into the machine. You could sit there and win and lose and win and lose and win and lose. You may be up $20 or down $20 at the end of the day. But if you were there for a couple of hours betting $2 every, you know, couple seconds, your handle number may be astronomical. It may be $4,000, $5,000. In reality, you just had that $100 that went back and forth over and over again. So it's just important to keep in mind when we look at handle numbers, obviously that has a relation to ultimately what the revenue is going to be. But um, it's important to know, like, if we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in handle, that doesn't necessarily mean there's hundreds of millions of dollars in the facility. It could be the same dollar that moves along very, you know, back and forth many times. So following up on Senator Lang's request, I think it'd be helpful to have take one facility or make up a facility and do a little chart that shows this much money and where it goes. I think that would be very helpful. And then I want to throw a little twist. What about poker? Because poker is handled a little bit differently. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the rooms do have poker and then there's regular poker and then there's tournaments. So can you just touch on, on how that all works? Oh, I'm just sad I was making this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, poker. How's the, how's the how does the handle work poker? Game with the chips have value, chips have no value. Explain the difference oh. in them. There you go. Are you going to test my number? Well, I, I can address the general. I, the, the, the Poker works differently in that the house takes a rake of it on, on the top. So they're not, as opposed to... Um, if you go to the roulette table, you know, it, the, the house gets paid based on the outcome of the game. Um, in poker, the, the house takes a rake uh, at, as part of the game for hosting the game. Oh, rake is just, they're taking a, a, they're taking a fee essentially for running the game. So it's not related specifically to the outcome. You're not playing, if you're playing in poker, you're not playing against the house. Um, they're just, they're, they're just basically taking a hosting fee for running the game, so for having the deal. When is that fee taken? I, I go and I put money on the table and they give me chips, I'm assuming. Yeah. So is a certain, certain they get certain less number of chips? So that, when does that transaction happen, that, that the rake happens? Right, the rake happens on the, uh, so you're you're actually, I'm not a poker expert, but I believe that I could maybe ask Mr. Gomes to help us out, but I th think that gets taken out of the pot as the action takes place. Correct. That's right. So everybody throws their chips in and they pull over, the dealer pulls over the rake, which is the casino's portion of it. But what, oh, so, but what percentage is the rake? Uh, it's a flat fee, I believe, per table. So right. I don't know the right. exact amount, but it's not high. And it's, right. it's that, right. every casino across the country does the exact same thing. Okay. Yeah. But, but then, uh, but I, I know I know uh, Representative Del Sanchez was a poker player, so I think he understands this too. So, well, yeah. thank you for the compliment, but it's you said, and it's different on the <laughs> tournament. Say? It's a flat percentage of you know if you play a tournament for a hundred dollars is twenty percent, I believe, for the. So that's rate. tournament play. Or tournament, tournament play, yeah, right. Yeah. But all right, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you go over the rent again? I, I'm kind of confused about the fixed rate rent. It's a fixed rate 
rental fee going in and there's a percentage of the portion going uh, can we but, uh, after that we're mixing apples and oranges here or? well can we also back up a little on the rent when did we put rent in in, in the statutes was it always there I, because it used to be the old days charitable gaming uh, you know, it used to be in somebody's in the basement of the church, and the, the company would come. And then, but then in the beginning, all of the charities actually had to be there and have a, a role in even handling the money. And then, the, then charitable gaming in our state evolved to a point. I'm assuming somewhere along the line, we don't have the charities helping, so that the facility decided they were going to charge rent. Is correct. That, is that a correct? So, assessment? as I understand it, because it was before my time dealing with charitable gambling. It was 2015, and the facilities which were operating charitable gambling were actually losing money, and they need to add rent as an additional profit center to allow the facilities to maintain operations. That's how it was explained to me. So that was that was the history of it. Correct. That was history. That's how rent was added to the law in 15. Okay. Let me get to now. You're so to to, this question. To answer, there'd be a base rent plus a percentage of the. Okay, that's where I'm confused. No, uh, I, I apologize. I probably confused you. It's just the base rent. So if you come in, it's, you would sign a contract with a game operator. It would be, let's just say, for $250 a night. That's what you would owe. Um, so the, way, the cleanest way that this would work is you'd make $1,000 as a charity. You'd have a contract for $250. So you would pay them their $250. You'd get a check for $1,000. And you'd net out seven hundred and fifty dollars. So, what is the ten percent of the charity's portion um, is returned to the, the operator as rent? It says. Which and it ranges from five to fifty percent by room. So, uh, on that slide, I think what that's meant to convey is that, um, on average, based on our analysis. Charities end up paying about 10%. Now, that is not, that's not how it's charged, okay? So I guess the, the best way to say it is charities still pay on, a, on a, a fixed rate. And based on our analysis of the, the relation between that fixed rate and how much money they actually get, it ends up being around 10% on average, if that makes sense. Okay. If follow. If follow. Yeah. And you also said they're not allowed to lose money. Correct. So that would be less rent or or the same rent? Cor correct. So if there if the if the amount of money, if the amount of revenue that the charity was going to get from the gaming day exceeded their agreed upon rent, um, they'd have to reduce that rent to at least make make it a break even for the charity. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I had a new charity approach me a couple of weeks ago that's I'm not going to mention the name of the facility that said they they got their first check the first it was electronically sent uh, but then they got a bill in the mail for rent no one talked to them about rent I, I think we need to we need to get our hands around rent here um, as part of this um, I, I I I told them well, I think there's a cap on it and I was wrong it doesn't sound like there's a cap on the rent and I, I, I think that's something that we need to really address. And I, I know it's one of our, I know one of our charges. So, but I think it would really be helpful to have a, a chart with ex, an example that we can, you know, one for games of chance and one for HHR, how the money flows. And I, I know that's it's totally different. And then I think we have an explanation now on on poker. I think we're okay. At, well. Uh, uh, well, Lucky Seven. I had a question about Lucky Seven too. Um, so, with with the advent of HHR, is it is it uh, to to have it, for the charitable locations? It used to be they had to have bingo running that day to do Lucky Sevens. Uh, from my observation, that wasn't always followed, but that's another discussion. But is is Lucky Seven in the charitable locations dying because of HHR? I would imagine they are, uh, because I don't. Are, are they still? Do some of these facilities still have bingo? And we have strictly bingo halls. We know those still exist. We know we have other, uh, you know, uh, veterans facilities, other locations that have bingo. 
um, the, the do sell Lucky Seven. Uh, but is Lucky Seven in, in the charitable gaming locations? Is that a dying thing? So, for the most part, yes. Um, there are still some facilities that are not have not have decided not to do HHR at this time. That still have Lucky Seven machines in games of chance facilities. So, so it's assuming that they have bingo. Because no, I thought the statute they, said that unless the statute changed, then they somewhere. no longer have to have bingo. Um, the, I the, law, that one. the law was changed with regard to that. Right. And Mr. Chair, just to, to explain a little bit about, I think some of the rationale behind that was um, we were getting um, very limited bingo events where maybe one or two members of uh, staff or people who were walking by. Uh, were being pulled into the room to run a, a bingo game for a few right. minutes right. so that they could keep Lucky 7 machines on. Um, so at, the legislature decided to divorce Lucky 7 from bingo and allow Lucky 7 to also be operated with Games of Chance. Again, because of HHR, the prevalence of that in Games of Chance facilities is definitely reduced, okay. uh, but it's not. It's it's still it's still present in some some locations. Okay, thank you. So, Senator Lang and then, then so again, just Fred, two things. I want to just go back and just clarify some of the rent. So rent comes out of the thirty-five percent that the charity gets, but on top of any other any other gaming operator gaming operators' money, they get rent on top of that, and it just ne it can ne never go negative. Is the only thing. That is correct. With the clarification that it is a it is a flat rate fee. It is not a, it is not related. By percentage to the thirty-five percent that they receive, it's a flat rate fee that comes out of that. 35%. And if that thirty-five percent is less than the rent, they pay nothing for rent. They pay they pay the lowest number for rent, and they get nothing. And I'm thinking a, a snowy Wednesday night when nobody decides to go out and game, right? Oh, and so right. they may have a flat fee, um, but the thirty-five percent is is less than the rent, so therefore they would just get zero. The charity would get zero dollars for that night's activity. Correct. So again, I I think we bring this up again in the next meeting. If you can provide us a chart that shows the flow, of the, the actual example of one facility, not real numbers, one facility. This is and show the various steps of how the money flows for both also, games of chance and. Yeah, that'll be helpful. Right. It, it, right. It'd be helpful to see what the range of rents are. And okay. so one more follow. -up. So we we'll go back to Lucky Seven. Our conversation now about Lucky Seven. So Lucky Seven are now allowed in social clubs, VFWs, American Legions, those kind of places, um, loose clubs. Um, how many license? How many facilities are those licensed by you as well? Do they have to come in and apply for a license? And how many of those locations have we seen an increase, a reduction in those Lucky Seven number of locations? The slide on I'd have to look to see for the actual number, but it's probably somewhere in the range of 300 or so. Well, uh, uh, Representative Doucette had his hand up before. And just go, going back to breakage real quick, because I've been kind of wondering I know the dedicated fund is 150,000. Um, and looking at the trend lines for uh, revenue right now, obviously breakage is going to be a bigger number. Are you seeing an uptick in requests for problem gaming issues? Uh, are you tracking that? Is it something we need to correct legislatively to make that dedicated fund bigger because of that? Or if, if you're not seeing any change, it's just curiosity. So we have been in touch with the um, with the council on um, problem gaming. Um, it was a, a private uh, entity that um, has been associated with the state for a number of years. Uh, they were contracted with the state um, uh, most recently in the last fiscal year. Um, we have not seen a significant increase. It's something that we've been looking to see. Um, there's been a pro probably a slight increase in the number of calls being received, um, but it's not um, it's 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 not 
escalating at the same level as the amount of gaming is. Um, so thus far, um, we haven't seen a huge uptick in requests for services. Well, yeah. Yeah, so to, to the point of um, the dedicated fund being set at 150, is that adequate at present? Is it something, you know, how does the director suggest we address that? I mean, candidly, it's, n it's not enough to do it well. It just isn't. It should be a larger fund. It should either be zero or significantly more. It's just enough to not fix a problem, but cause one in the sense of if you should hire staff, there should be dedicated folks looking at this. There should be dedicated research looking at this. Um, one of the difficulties is if you don't look for a problem, you don't see the problem. And so there are more folks that probably have an issue that are being addressed currently. So to uh, be clear, again, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry, Mr. Chairman, Let's be clear. Lottery doesn't have staff that is looking at specifics to problem gaming. We, we deal with an outside vendor. Correct. So okay. the, the law created a council on problem gambling, which we which is administratively tied to us, which has a specific meaning in the law. So I, as you can imagine, it would be more than awkward if I was the head of council on problem gambling. It would make no sense. So I'm fully in support of it, but certainly divested from it. Okay. Representative Brody had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for my own information, mostly, but um, Lucky Seven decline is that because of the Kino? Um, I know. No, I would. It would likely be that folks that had Lucky Seven machines have now have historic horse racing machines. Because a lot of the social clubs have uh, yeah. had Lucky Sevens for years, and they made yeah. quite a bit of money. And then now, all of a sudden, they got the Kino, and now they're taking out the Lucky Sevens. Um, I, I have you seen that? We could take a look and see, do some analysis on that. I, frankly, we haven't at this point. I think the decline obviously is is relatively slight, and anecdotally, I would have to say there were there were a few fairly large games of chance facilities that had a significant number of lucky seven machines. Um, what the one in Manchester um, that's that has. Um, transfer to historic horse racing, I think that would have the most material impact on that lucky seven number. So I, anecdotally, I don't think we've seen that Kino is, um, has, has eaten into the, those, but um, we, can, we can do some further analysis on that and come back to you on it. Well, the interesting thing about Kino, it's different than, than uh, uh, charitable gaming, is that a town has to vote it in. Uh, so not every town. Where, where are we with that? Is it about half the towns or cities? Where, <laughs> you know, it's your favorite topic. No, actually, it's ironic. I was in Portsmouth last night. Oh, you were? Um, still pitching there, right? For the public <laughs> hearing on Kino, uh, the Portsmouth uh, Mayor and City Council. We have 84 towns, nine cities, and one unincorporated township that have authorized Kino. Um, there are a number of towns and cities that are not cities, number of towns and unincorporated townships where there would be no licensee, so we didn't seek approval, you know, of some of the places, particularly up North Country. Right. Um, and so there are a few cities like Concord, for example, that hasn't approved it. Keene hasn't approved it. Um, Portsmouth has yet to approve it. You know, knock on wood, they will uh, next election. Um, but the vast majority of the state's population is that lives in a place where Keno or is right. bordering a, a t town that so. see itself Keno. So my town of Stratum, I, I got a uh, finally got somebody. I'm not a, a former constituent. Let's say, called me. He says, Pat, why don't we have Kino here? And I said, Well, first step, go talk to the three restaurants that pour liquor in this town, and if if they want it, then then to talk to the selectmen yeah. about getting a, a warrant article. But I don't think any of the three restaurants really want it. So so why bother? You know, as as a practical matter, the of the bars and taverns that sell Kino, it's one in five. Launch you know, and it's the decision by the business owner whether they are want it or not want it. But right. some businesses fits great in sports bar; it does great. Right. Um, but you know, if you sell, if you're a high, fine dining, not going to happen. So, so, uh, Representative Ames. So this is a question on historic horse racing and the uh, pick out or commission which is in the statute at up to 12 percent um, and I've uh, puzzled over that, that those words up to 12 percent 
and uh, wondered what are the what are the factors that uh, key into a uh, less than twelve percent um, takeout and uh, and what in fact are you seeing in terms of takeout? Um, fundamentally, that's a decision by the operator and the floor mix of the machines at any given time, and it has a number of variables. One is the player base that you're deriving your revenue from. If there's no other choice, so for example, say there was a HHR facility in Pittsburgh, there's nothing else around. You could have a lower prize payout. But if you're in an area where there's four or five facilities around you, you have to have a competitive prize payout because the players will know and they will know immediately. And so that's going to be a point of a variable the operator will want to use competitively against the other rooms nearby. And that's a decision, you know, day in, day out. The floor mix, um, we joke there are some of our facilities that they never saw a hand card they didn't like. So they keep moving machines around constantly to get the right floor mix. And so um, that's what, that's, that's, it's very much a business decision on the operator on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Follow up, go set. It looks like you're formulating on. <laughs> so let's see. We're we're talking about takeout from the handle. Yes. And the handle is everything bet. Do I have that right? No. So we're talking takeout of the money left at the end of the night. Yeah. 12, no. I'm sorry. We're taking. Yes. We're talking about prize pet. Yes. We're talking about handle. Correct. So in the example before, where they're two dollars, two dollars, two dollars. Yeah. It's the. Two dollars times ten times he did it uh, yeah. is twenty dollars, and that's that's the that's the handle, and then the yeah. takeout from yes. it is up to twelve percent of that. Do I have that right? You do. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Yes, you do. Okay. And, and that number is an incredibly important part of a facility's success or failure in gambling. Yeah. So, uh, and this is why it's very difficult to do an overview of everything because the the accounting that we went through before of you have the handle then you have the prizes paid and then you have the till and you start making divisions out of that that is not how historic horse racing operates historic horse racing operates on a takeout at the top so the house takes the money off of the top and then it's paramutual wagering so the all of the prize money then goes into a pool that is then competed for amongst the players mm -hmm. so the accounting of, from our perspective for HHR is a little bit flipped on its head where the money gets taken off the top and then you start talking about the prizes, the prize pool at that point in time. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, well, I, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to let uh, Senator Alessandro, I think you're going to, and then if you think of it. Then... But if you use the paramutual concept, that $2 bet, that you put in off the top comes 10 cents, right? Off each dollar, Correct. which is uh, Correct. all right. And then, and then you get, you get returned on, on your, on your, on your bet based on the, the calculation is based on the amount of the money that's, that's bet, but off the top. Correct. A, right. Correct. And to uh, represent names earlier, just, uh, question about how much it actually comes in. It's right. a lot more than 12. It actually comes in just slightly under 10 it, on right. average. Okay, so people should, people should understand that. So is that, is that under 10 consistent with other locate other facilities? Uh, yes. You make it too high, then, yes. then the payouts are going to be less and then you lose. Yeah, I, I looked at, uh, Maine, sorry. I looked at Maine and Rhode Island last night and it's very competitive with those. Okay. I think Rhode Island, one of the rooms has a smaller, has a, a lower payout, but I think it's because it's geographically uh, separated. Someone have a question? We, okay. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, nationwide, it's somewhere between 8 and 12%, and that's what operators have found is the best return to get the customers back, right? You take yeah. 15, 20%, you're not going to get the return. The players aren't going to have an entertaining experience. Right. Right. So that's really a, kind of where the nation settled in. Right. Some jurisdictions, Vegas, Atlantic City, where it's highly competitive and I want more time on device for my players. That's going to be my competitive advantage. Like 
um, like you'd mentioned, that's when you see a little bit lower, but they're still not lower than about 7%. Yeah, I mean, the provision regarding 12% was actually put in as a consumer protection at the time. It was not meant to be a, it was meant to say, you won't go lower than this because if you have a room up in Berlin, for example, where it has no competition, it would be unfair to have those players be have a lesser product. Yeah, then there's jurisdictions where there is no cap. You could hold 80% if you want it, but all the operators are still in that 8 to 12%. Right, right. Uh, Senator, uh, yeah, Representative yeah. Uh, Ames again. I'm oh, sorry. Wait. No. Representative Ames again. Yeah. Um, so there are slots that are not paramutual, much more um, uh, frequent in the United States. And there's historic horse racing, which is on a paramutual basis. And so um, my understanding is sort of built into the slot machine. Uh, machine programming is essentially a takeout because the the payback is not a hundred percent. It's less every overall. There's going to be a loss to those who gamble with slot machines, and that's in the eight to twelve percent range that you were talking about. Correct. Slot machines, HHR. They have other class two, which are based on lottery um, math. It's all in that. Eight to twelve percent, for the most so part. If I may, it's it's really a, a question of competition, engaging the market, and what what you can take out, and and uh, you won't be hurt by it competitively, and what you can't. Is right. Right? It's just about getting the players back, right? If I go in, and I lose too much money, or I don't get enough time playing, I'm not entertained, or I never win, then I'm not going to get those players back. Uh, for the for the com commission. Um, well, I, my plan at the moment is to go to 1130. Does do others have pressing things before that or do? Okay, because I think there's still more questions. But for respect of everybody's time, we'll keep it to two hours for today. Um, I do have a question. I'm looking at, at the commission, the official commission charge, whether, whether the state should limit the number of charitable gaming locations. Now, right now, there's no limit. I can come, you know, Senator Lang and I could say we're gonna we want to open one of these places if we meet all the characteristics of, uh, uh, you know, background checks and all that. We can open one of these. Uh, we don't have a re we don't have a restriction on the number. Uh, unlike Keno, we don't because I, I I was grilled on this when when my HHR bill was well why don't we why don't we have a, a opt in. For the towns for historic racing, I would say, well, no, this is just a form of of gaming that that already exists in these locations. So, but the question becomes: in the future, do do we want to limit the number of these locations? That's the big issue to me to address. Uh, I know when we had our casino bills in the old days. There was always one or two. Then it was arguments: why not four? Right now, we have like twelve. Is it? It's well. It's ten HHR facilities uh, operating currently, and there are more will come online. Okay. Um, okay, but with less owners, right? There's owners that own multiples. Correct. Correct. Right. Right. But how about his uh, charitable gaming itself? How many? How many charitable gaming? Fourteen. We're at fourteen now. Yeah. So we had a high water mark of around 16. 16, Right. So okay. So this is one of the big issues we got. We got to address, um, and. Um, and, and the, the problem for me is we want more charities involved. So the way to get more charities involved is to have more of these. Uh, but then as we consolidate, because there's some consolidation going on, and we're taking two smaller ones and making one larger one, and but we're limiting we're limiting it to two charities where the, where the charities are going to get an astronomical amount because they're bigger, bigger facilities. So we have to have some kind of, I think, in our discussions, uh, how do we how do we control that? Um, my goal in the, with HHR was not to hurt any of the existing charities and what they were making, and I, I think we've succeeded in that. Um, but you know, going forward, if we wind up having consolidation and bigger facilities, I think we have to have we have to look at what that looks like in terms of the number of charities that can participate any given day. 
uh, because we're, we're looking at right now. My understanding is that uh, for the bigger bigger halls that we have, um, for ten days you can walk away with uh, a charity. You can walk away with over a hundred thousand uh, for basically doing nothing, and they love it, uh, and I don't blame them. Um, and it's it's a wonderful thing for the charities, uh, but it's really I think we got to really that's why I say big picture because the, the environment is changing. That we're you know the, the whole complexion. A lot of outsiders now coming in. Probably a lot more money coming in building larger facilities. Um, um, we don't have any. Again, all of our regulations and all of our rules were based on smaller facilities uh, that uh, you know all did okay. Uh, now the world has changed, and we got to I think have to address that. But one of my thoughts was, um, and I, I know. Uh, Representative Ames was very active when we were looking at <laughs> casino casinos. Um, you, you chaired a commission looking at the regulations, how we would do that, and that was that was at the heart of all of the other uh, uh, gaming bills for casino bills that came, and then then those bills stopped because there was no interest anymore. Um, is it? Do we, I'm just throwing this out to the commission and the Charlie, you too. Uh, do we want to match up what Representative Ames's report did with what our regulations are today? Because basically the facilities we have are real casinos. I mean, with HHR, they are real casinos. Um, I, I think I didn't talk to you in advance about this, but do you think that would make some sense? And then Charlie... The uh, undertaking of that commission back in 2014 or 13, something like that, um, was to identify the reg regulatory structure that should be in place in the event that the legislature decided to go right. forward with a large casino. and. It was um, either in the either a single large facility or maybe two or may, possibly three, but a very small number. So big casino, uh, the commission's charge was not to opine on the should or shouldn't, but if you do it, this would be uh, the best way to do it, at least in the judgment of the commission. And that's what we developed. Um, and in the end, put forward uh, separately from the commission a bill, and I sponsored that, that called for a large casino, maybe two, I don't remember, uh, basically using the regulatory structure. And that came close, but didn't make it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of material in there, and the uh, commission was uh, assisted in its work by a entity that uh, we contracted with after a competitive bidding process, uh, White Sands Gaming, something like that. Um, and they were very good, I thought, we all thought, actually. And, uh, and so there's a lot of material there that could be looked at in connection with this, but bear in mind that unless there was a recommendation to consolidate what's out there already, which would be extremely difficult, and go to a, um, a large casino um, platform, if you will. Um, a lot of it is for large casinos. A lot of the work product there is for a large casino model. And we're talking about, probably, we're talking about uh, a, uh, a a number of, and that's what part of our our, um, our charge, uh, how big the number is, a number of relatively small gaming rooms, um, as I understand it. Um, and so there is that, that starting point. Do we want to look at the big ones? Uh, and, which means consolidation, because it really doesn't, a big one is going to swallow up every, everything that's small, um, probably. I don't know. Um, yeah, right. so, so right. it, was, it was the Massachusetts model uh, that we were looking at at that time. Okay, so, but there are certain principles in that 
there are certain principles in there, whether it's a large casino or a small casino, wouldn't you say? I mean, of I, I was just I'm, I'm thinking out loud here that that possibly we could match that up with what the regulations we have. Is there something that we're missing that we need to have? Uh, because I know, you know I wish Senator D'Alessandro was still here. Um, um, I know that's one of his big things. You know, is 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 the regulations proper? Now, last term we had a, a joint committee with the Senate where we toured these. They think you were on it. We toured a bunch of these facilities, and from our from our standpoint, things look pretty good. You know, we looked at this. We saw the cameras. We saw the the, the room, the counting room. Um, and all the other things that are going on. Um, I'm just saying, is there a way that we could we could take advantage of the work that you had done to match it up with the regulations that we have now? Is there something that else that we need to do? Um, and Lou, I'm, I'm, I, I wish you were here for what I just said. Um, I, I, was I was suggesting that possibly we take the the report that was done uh, that was chaired by uh, the commission that was chaired by uh, representative ames and match it up to our regulations now but representative ames feels that well that was really for a large large casino maybe right it wouldn't be relevant um but i thought maybe there are certain aspects of that that maybe we could learn from that's all so I, I think uh, Abe's, representative ames is correct that was for a large facility that's what we looked at that's all. That's all the information we gathered, but certainly there are a few things there that we could we could take uh, would help us here. Uh, but indeed, he's exactly right. That was for a large facility, and that's where we spend all of our time and effort at that at that point in time. But it seems to me we're we're growing into larger facilities here. That was my point, and, and I think that, that, that that's that's right. where the the interface or the, or the synergy takes place. Because right. we have, uh, right. if you if you look at the television, we have large casinos here in Manchester that offer everything. So, well, so the, uh, some of it could be incorporated. You know, it's funny how the market works. Yeah, you know, if right. I was a big casino guy, I look at at New Hampshire and say, "Well, wait a minute, this is wide open. There's no there's no limit on number of casinos. Well, why am I going to be competing with fourteen other fifteen other locations?" Uh, maybe I'm not going to build a bigger place here, um, but then again, it's wide open. They could build a bigger place if they wanted to take the risk. So, uh, again, we, we've got plenty of time to talk about sure. these things. And, and the landscape has changed dramatically since uh, since our right. last uh, right since our last Senator, thing. Thank you. So, so I guess I, I'm being, talking about this consolidation thing you you were commenting on, and I think we have a consolidation of ownership. Right. So we have some ownership consolidation going on where you have one person or, or one business managing multiple um, versus the mom and pop we talked about where you have one person managing one facility. Um, but to my knowledge, we haven't seen a consolidation where someone's walked in and said, we're going to close these three down and focus on this one. That hasn't been um, what's going on within the state. Yeah. Well, while they're buying multiple ones, they're not consolidating into a single giant facility. As far as I know, how about Nashua? What's actually, going on? That, that actually Nashua? happened in Keene. There were two facilities that merged into one, but other than that, you are correct, Senator. Right. And how many? Yeah. Do, how many do we have in Nashua? Do we have three? Three. Yes. Because, but now two it's eligible two. for HHR. But, but now it's going to be two, correct? Uh, I don't know what you know. I know. What, what we know about the plans in Nashua for the expansion done by the mall. Well, it's, they're it's going nice. to the Pheasant, Pheasant Lane Mall. We, we don't know. The, as as the regulator, we have not been approached with a plan. Okay. With the, so as a practical matter, when it comes to these, we're the last stop on the line. Right. You have to go to the town first before you can visit. Before You you have to get a town approval before you can apply with us. So. Right. right. I follow up. So, yeah. so, so, again, I just wanted to clarify that consolidation necessarily, someone's buying up 14 casinos is going to turn into one giant casino in New Hampshire. That's not what's happening in the industry right now, as far as I know. Um, and then sec secondly, just to remind everybody, we currently have a moratorium, right? So out of the 14 gaming licenses, that's the maximum number of HHR licenses we can have in this state that expires 24, June, end of June 24, if I'm not mistaken, July I want 24, that moratorium goes away. And again, anybody who applied for a gaming license would be eligible to add the modifier of having HHR as well. 
Um, so there's currently a little bit of constraint on the market, um, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, I've just remind what, what Executive Director uh, McIntyre said was that the one casino in, in um, Twin Rivers, 3,500 gaming machines in one facility. We have roughly 1,600 spread out amongst 10 facilities. So there is some market space and market gap that's happening, again, to deal with, I'm assuming, travel plans, right, uh, for people. Yeah, and most of the, the facilities are concentrated, as you can imagine, on the border. Um, there's not a lot of interest north of, say, Concord. Uh, most of the facilities are within sort of that magic one-hour drive of the mass border. Again, but but again, it's un, unconstrained right now. Um, we're talking the future now, not what's happening now. It, it, it could, a big casino could move in if they wanted to with all the amenities, if they wanted to take the risk. Uh, there's nothing stopping them. Right. Where when we talked, we used to talk about casinos, it was always limiting the number to two or three, but I, I, I like it the way it is now myself. I like it spread out the way it is uh, because we're helping charities throughout the throughout the state as best we can. Um, and uh, but but it's up to us as at the end product of this to address that issue. And we have to address what do we want this to look like? Um, at least, uh, Senator. I, 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 if, if I understand the world of people right now, there are, there are three proposals for large facilities. One in Rochester at the Lilac Wall, one in Concord, right? And there's a proposal before the Planning Board of Concord for a rather large facility. And there's, uh, there's this situation in Nashua where they would like to move from one area to, to the shopping center, which uh, <clears throat> represents, uh, in, in terms of square footage, an enormous growth, uh, growth pattern. So I, I, I think... Uh, What's hap what, what I see happening here, and I think this is the issue that, that we all have to be cognizant of, is, is the enormous expansion of, a, of an existing venue. And, and now you've got to talk, talk about the, the number of charities that are going to be there, the amount of money that's raised there, uh, when historic horse racing uh, comes there. But when you, when you talk about 100,000 square feet, now, that's not the church basement, uh, to the best of my knowledge. And, and then, you know, it isn't Father, Father Mahoney getting up and saying, Team number two will conduct the games on Tuesday night. Those, those days are gone forever. And uh, I, I, I think that's the thing we, we have to be cognizant of, both the charities and, and us as, as regulators. Because if you get that kind of, of expansion, it's going to require certainly more surveillance on, on, on part of, of the entity, the Lottery Commission, and there'll be more there'll be more activity. But that seems to be in play uh, as we speak, and uh, we can't limit advertising. It, it, marketing is a is a good strategy, <clears throat> but we we're seeing television advertising that's advertising casinos in New Hampshire. Uh, I, I think that's something we have never seen before. We're advertising casinos in New Hampshire. That gives people an opinion that we have full-range gambling, uh, you know, in, in New Hampshire. And I think those are the things that we should be cognizant of, and that right. our committee should be should be looking at. You know, thank this, you, Mr. Chairman. This is a small thing, but and then thinking about this last night, I don't think in our statutes we do we do we have the term casino. No, it's it's one of the sticking points. So as you can imagine, a number of cities and towns have asked us to go visit them because of this very topic. And I, they've asked me to define casino. And I said it's not defined because it's not in the, in the law. The law calls these charitable gambling facilities, and so do I. You know, we're in the executive branch. We don't get to write laws and make up words. But, um, so but, no, no, it doesn't. It, there's a law related to a casino or house of ill repute. Uh, being, but, but other than that, there's nowhere in the law is they're defined. Surely historic horse racing. You didn't know that was part of your job? Sorry? You didn't know that was part of your job? To make like that? Yeah. My wife would suggest that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that, that just dawned on me last night. Because most of these facilities, they're calling themselves casinos now. And technically, well, is that, it's not violating a law, I don't think, but it's... 
but it's it's but the, these know. facilities called themselves casinos before they were HHR for authorized. Right. They did. Like I mean it's you know, you could call yourself a bistro, a cafe, a restaurant. I don't know what it is. It's just it's a gaming facility. Right. And so Well, I think it's a small thing, but I think I think casinos are here, so I think I think the legislature should at least define it in the statutes. That's something that can be in the report that we could suggest to the legislature to do. And also, I could suggest, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm not in that seat, but if I could ask a question, yeah, if we could also um, re review a fee or a cost of doing business to communities that actually host these, it would certainly go a long way to those communities. Of the number I have visited, and has been a bunch, it has been number one on their topic is, I expect increased services in my community for this activity. Can we get money from the state for <laughs> to reimburse us essentially for this? And so, like the uh, casino bill, Representative Ames and I worked on a number of years ago, included a essentially a mitigation fund for the local community to be to host this facility. I think that makes a lot of sense, Mr. Chair. Right. I know it's in the it's in our charge, but I just want to bring it up again. Okay, I, I agree with that. That's that's good because again, we're 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 looking at everything. I, 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 you can't get away with not looking at it all and say it's grown, it's growing. What do we want it to look like? That's a good point. When we used to do the casino bills, that was always a point of issue. The town, you know, was always the uh, Rockingham Park was always the. Rockingham Park was the location. It was the ideal location. They all had plans for, for a Rockingham Park uh, location. That's gone now. Um, but I remember that there was there was provisions in there to to help the lo to Salem out with the the traffic issues and everything else. In, in that legislation, there were provisions for the for the for the counties and for for the locals uh, with regard to. Sharing of revenues, but also the law enforcement, the ability of the locals to uh, to take to get their share, but also to participate. Yeah, and, and these kinds of things are going to are going to pop up, pop up in my opinion because of the size of the entities. I mean, the entities are growing in physical space, and and I think that's something that we have to think about. Uh, call, look at when when the public and the marketing sees a casino, they expect something. There's an expectation there, and it isn't it isn't the expectation for charitable gaming. It's an expectation for a casino, and that's how the, that's how they are now being marketed as casinos. That requires a certain amount of, of scrutiny on the part of, of the locals, because the locals are being called to service the parking lots, uh, and, and I know in Manchester that has been a concern to, to our police force. What's happened in those in those parking lots? Uh, aberrant behavior, uh, the stealing of, of vehicles, et, et cetera. So sure, there's 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 a certain there's a certain amount of cost associated with this that's got to be absorbed by somebody because somebody's got to pay it. So well, I just want to follow on Tim. Um, so yeah, when we took the tours, we did ask the question about security. Most of most of the facilities had security inside security on their own. Um, it, it, I can't recall if that's in the statute that they had to have security, but most did have security. It's it's a regulatory requirement for the historic horse racing facilities to have a security plan that we um, so we don't we don't dictate exactly what that needs to be, but they need to demonstrate. To so us. so his for facilities with HHR machines. Correct. Okay. We do um, not have a similar rule or statute. Um, with respect to games of chance generally. Right, right. Again, this is something that we should be addressing as, as we go along. Tim? Thank you, sir. So, in simulcast racing, right, again, a different form of charitable gaming that goes on, but simulcast racing that goes on, um, I know the Brook, I'm not sure I should say their name, but they, they pay Seabrook a fee for operating simulcasts to the tune of about $25,000 a year the town gets for allowing that activity. So again, maybe we can bring the language in that looks where that comes from and what that fee looks like. And maybe there's a place for that kind of similar language in future legislation. I mean, yeah, there's no question. There's certainly regarding the percentage that is the 25%, that can be looked at in terms of who gets what. I, the budgeted amount for the state, we will well exceed that. And so 
there's more money as well as other funds available. The, the profitability of this is more than double what it was anticipated to be. And that's only going to accelerate as facilities come online in Nashua and otherwise there will be significant sums of money generated by this activity that could be sent to the cities and towns. Hello? Yeah. Oh. So again, I'm not saying where the percentage comes from, what yeah. happens or anything else. It just seems like we already have a mechanism in law when it comes to gaming for, for revenue sure. sharing with communities. We probably try to, should try to stay consistent in that model. Um, and maybe we, so we should probably look at what that looks like yeah. and see how we can do that. I also think it should be related to the amount of activity in the city or town. So like Nashua would get more than Lebanon just because of the activity involved and how much it would be. So. Again, I just, I just want to stay consistent, right? So I'm not sure how that historic, how that uh, simulcast racing model works to give it to the municipality and what what mechanism in law does that. So it's not through us. So, uh, so that's look, their, them on their own are, are think, choosing think, to do that. I think so. I'll, I'll, we'll check them. Thank you. You all set the, you have your light on. I was thought oh. that you were going to. No, it's okay. <laughs> so um, any other questions from? Anyone? I do have a question. Okay. Representative Janagian. Yeah, so I was just looking at the um, the second to last page, the charity revenue four year comparison. And um, you said bingo is a lost leader, so I can see there's negative amounts for each year there. So I'm assuming the revenue in each column there, is that a net revenue after expenses? Okay, so the, the charities have they've paid the rent, and then then they've also subtracted whatever um, wages they've paid or other expenses they've incurred, and then this is the net. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions for today? Seeing none, so let's let's uh, talk about the next meeting. So the first, oh, is there another one? Oh, Representative Ames. I think um, there, there is a question that needs to be thought about. Maybe we should talk about it next time, it's up to you. But uh, there is $150,000, is $150,000 yeah, uh, allocated to the work of this commission. And the question, obvious question is, how can we best make use of that? And, uh, you know, we're getting going and I, uh, in, we're starting into a time period, we're starting late cons because of various things that have happened. And uh, here we are, uh, we're gonna run out of time. In the meantime, if, if we're gonna get expert help, if that's what the money is gonna be spent on, we need to figure that out and figure out what we want that help to focus on. Um, the one example, uh, which I may be a poor example, but it's we talked about uh, the bill that I worked on years ago, and the uh, report of that commission. We could have, uh, we could certainly use help. I'm not going to do it. Uh, going through um, that work product and identifying parts of it that should be. That might be helpful to the work of this commission, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it's it's funny you say that because that's where I, that's why I was going with that. Uh, you, I, I did, but it didn't seem like there was that much excitement about doing it. But I, I was thinking of using an outsider to to go through that. But probably, you know, we have to go out to bid. I would imagine to have somebody help us with that and to match it up with our regulations here. Um, and uh, using a white sands kind of white sands like it was white, sand. white sands kind of firm. Uh, to do that, um, because that, that's the area I thought we would need help on, because none of us have the time to do that or the expertise to do that. Uh, Senator? Because Casido, <clears throat> charitable gaming has grown across the country. It, I, I mean, we think of it as, as New Hampshire, but Delaware had to put charitable gaming in. They were the first state to, to have the casinos at the tracks, and that was a model that we used in the past. But there have been they've been uh, forced to have charitable gaming. So charitable gaming is there, and we, we ought to be able to examine what it's, what's happened around the, <laughs> around the country with regard to this, because it, it's, in my opinion, it's becoming very, very large, very large. And I'm sure that maybe 10 years from now, that 
that might occupy uh, the greatest portion of the of the activity by by the lottery commission. Uh, Rev. Sam Ames, when when uh, was there a bid process to get get them in? I don't know how the, the state. I would imagine there was some kind of a. Yeah, so it's um, White Sands, uh, New Jersey, and there's a number of companies that do this. Like Spectrum comes to mind. They're also out of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> there are a number of consultants that could do this type of stuff. Fundamentally, the recommendations of the White Sands report we've tried to incorporate into our operations. Because if you're doing a, if you're gambling in the state, you should have the comfort that it's being regulated well. And regardless of what you call it, we should do it correctly. And so we've tried to incorporate that into our operations so that I, I can tell you with a certainty approaching death and taxes, we're nowhere near as bad as it was in 15 when we did this, when we did that report in terms of regulations. I mean, obviously we can make an improvements, but it, it's done much, much better now. So, so you know the companies who do this kind of work? So what I'm hearing, it, you know also, they are. not consumer companies, but there are companies that do this. Yes, there are yeah. consultants that do okay. um, this, and I, I mean, I certainly could generate a list pretty quickly okay. um, for the next. And if we want to go to bid, it's not that terribly hard to do. Okay. Certainly, we had a number of. When I was on a study commission back in 2011, we had consultants come in then, and there I know yeah. a number of them are still uh, there. Uh, Lou and I were on that one together. I remember. Yeah, yeah. So. Certainly, and there's a budget, and the budget, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't address this earlier, but the, the budget I forwarded around was one, administrative services required us to generate a budget prior to us meeting the last time, so I had to submit something for admin services, which can be amended if the body sees fit. That, that's okay. just a, a placeholder, essentially, for a budget. Yes. Uh, what, what I would recommend, and I've seen in other jurisdictions, is to get the list. There's probably two to four of these very reputable um, organizations that worked for other states, have them come in to either the next meeting, allocate 10 minutes each, let them pitch, and then when we refine the scope, send that out and let them come back with their number. Is there we we could even arrange that remotely if they wanted to pitch sort of via Tooms or Zoom, uh, Zoom or Teams. <laughs> Charlie, I'll... I'll, I'll... I'll reach out to you. We'll, we'll coordinate yeah, that. Okay, yeah, please. Thanks. Thank you for that idea. So, uh, and again, eventually we have to do an RFP of some kind, correct? Yeah, and actually, I oddly might have the draft of the one we did before somewhere in my files. So, um, there's also, I, I've talked to Charlie about this before, Nickel G's, which is the National Council of Legislators from Gaming States, right. which will provide us an incredible amount of research. I think it's like a $2,500 membership a year annually for the state or something like that. But they'll open up their all of their white papers to us, include responsible gaming conversations, um, you know, uh, financials for a lot for gambling that's going on across multiple states. So I'd consider joining an organization like that that could provide us just simple white papers that we can read and understand without necessarily, I mean, as in addition to whatever else we choose to do. Okay. Do you belong to any of those? You, you must get stuff. You must get. In fact, actually, to Senator's point, I get asked every year, am I going to Nickel G's this year? And I always say, no, we're not members. Right. And they're like, we keep adding more to the pile. And so we're the number one sports betting state in the country in terms of per capita. Next number two, sorry. Europe's number one. We're three now? Damn it. <laughs> so we're a very prevalent sports betting uh, state. So we get asked frequently to be on panels at Nickel G's. And I have to say, sorry, but not going. So, okay. yeah. So just to be full disclosure, I have been on their panels before to discuss, discuss gaming, gaming legislation, what New Hampshire's doing, how it's going. Um, I find it to be an incredibly useful tool to find out what's going on in other states, how they're regulating things, what their financial models look like. Um, there's been some incredible, again, I've done two or three of their events. Um, and it's an incredible conversation. So you suggest, and uh, they charge a fee for this information? Yeah. So. Well, no, if we're a member, we would get it as part oh, of the oh, member. Oh, to join right? So for a simple flat fee, we could probably get access to lots of white papers and conversation points that are available only to the members of Nickel G's without having it necessarily. Probably not a bad way to spend the money. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like usable. Well, so I, the commission I mean, will pay for you to get that. Certainly, I, I, we belong to a number of associations as well and, and sort of, Get the benefits of this membership just because of shared knowledge of our industry. Yeah. 
what kind of dues are we talking about? Or I think it's something like twenty five hundred bucks a year, five maybe five grand a year. Yeah. Most. Okay. All right. All right. So let's let's talk about the next meeting. So I think I think we continue on this thing. I'll talk to Charlie to see if we can. Um, I'm going to kind of guide it, you know, if I'm a company, I guess if they prefer to have the RFP in front of them before they come in and, and make a presentation because we have to be kind of specific as to what we're looking for. And then we can have a preliminary, invite them to our next meeting and they can tell us who they are, but they're not going to probably, they can say these are the services we offer. Um, so, um, but that plus having, I think Charlie, uh, uh, kind of a, there's a lot to do with the split of the money and the split of the money is something that we need to really understand how that works having that sample of how that works for each of the category you know the two major categories could also recommend that we pre present an analysis of gaming across new england because it's the most comparator area we do this right. in terms of the, the revenue split the size of the area because it will all impact on how we go forward um, the market is the market. If you look back 20 years, casinos didn't exist essentially in New England other than the tribes in Connecticut. And now it's a much, much more mature market. And so okay. what we do going forward should have it. Like we don't do this in a bubble. New England's a very small area. And so I was going to suggest we do that as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's great. And then don't forget the, uh, okay. Just to concur in that. I think that's very important. And, uh, I think it's important that it be done in a way that can relate Massachusetts slots facility to charitable gaming facilities here with HHR and the different ways in which we um, require the revenue that's produced is distributed compared to and then there's the uh, licensing fee which in Massachusetts is multiple thousands um, you know, for the slots, it's maybe 25,000, and then the big one is much. The, uh, it's million. So, yeah. uh, Wynn and Springfield is $85 million license fee, and yeah. Plain Ridge was $25 million license fee. 25. And they pay yeah, every so. year a $600 license fee per machine. Yeah. So, so that would be great. Uh, really and, important. To and also, to that end, I did um, make a point of printing out the uh, tracker study for the American Gaming Association, which tracks revenue across the country by jurisdiction. So I have a copy for everybody. I didn't want to pass it out because Senator Lang looked at me like I had three heads when I brought a stack of paperwork and I was afraid of getting shot. So um, I have that as well. If you want to grab a copy, it goes by jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Why don't, we, why don't we hold the next meeting? You can have okay, that. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll hold it then. Okay. Uh, last thing. Part of the next meeting, yeah. RSA 284 colon 23 is where that municipal language comes from. It is regulated by the state. Okay, yeah. So 284.23. Okay. So I'll work with Charlie. We'll finalize all the things for the agenda that Charlie will be doing. Um, and then we'll make a decision whether we want to bring these companies in. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so when? So let's work backwards. We have to have our work done by November 1st of 2024. That's 12 months. Um, I, I, I don't think meeting once a month is enough. Uh, every other week may be a little too much. I'm, I'm thinking about maybe every third week. Uh, what's gonna happen though, once we hit June, the legislators around the table are gonna worry, start worrying about running for office again uh, and but we do have until you know November 1st plus we have to have some time to write a report so um, I, I was thinking of starting with uh, um, every third week um, I'm willing to do every other week uh, but I'm just looking for everybody's sense of of that I uh Mr. Chairman, the third week would be November 7th, and that's election day. Yeah, Just it doesn't to... necessarily have to be a Tuesday either. Okay. And then well, the fourth week is the 14th. No, I was thinking the week of the 6th. Um, 
I guess it would be better to have a standard day that we do this on. Uh, I know it's election day that day, so the legislators have to be cover, you know, cover the uh, elections. A lot of them. Um, Right. So yeah, right now we're out of session. And there, but but brings us. To the, let's talk about the room for a minute. Um, let, let's talk about this. We're using this room right now. And when the Senate's in session, uh, is the middle of the week is a problem. Uh, I mean Mondays and Fridays, is that a problem? Or do we want to meet at lottery? Do you have a com you have a conference room? Right. Well, the house is starting to meet more in those days. Right. Yeah. So it have to be Monday or Monday or Friday. Uh, is it easier to get this room on a Monday? Obviously, it, 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 would it be an issue? Right. So if this was a if this was a house if this was a house commission, they would say go go find a space outside. Um, so I've I've always worked with um, you know Department of Revenue whoever we could meet there. Um, easier for you <laughs> for speaking minutes too. Um, but um, but until we're in session, that's not an issue. So. Right. Okay, so, but for next meeting, can we do it on the 6th, but start a little bit later? Because there's a hearing that I have to be at at 930 uh, to testify on, on uh, something. Um, um, maybe... Uh, 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock on Monday the 6th. Can everybody make that? On the 6th? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? And to, and uh, Tim, can you help me out to see if, the, I don't know who here regulates the rooms. Can you help me with that? Oh, Sonia? Okay, we'll talk afterwards. We'll, we'll, we'll firm that up. All right, and we'll, we'll get the agenda out ahead of time. Um, <laughs> Assume assume it's in this room, but may, that may change. And then we, we can further continue to talk about the scheduling, how we want to do it going forward after that. 10 to 12, yeah. All right. All right. So is there anything else for our next meeting that <clears throat> members would want to at least touch on? Um, Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Our access to research, if you want to. So Kelly has all the addresses. So if I gave yeah. her the agenda, she'll she can mail yeah, it out there. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. Talk. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Um, I think we're set until uh, the 6th, and uh, we'll move forward from there. Remember, we're, we're you guys coming up with a roadmap for the future here. That's what we're going to do. So it doesn't mean that, that that's law. That means we're making recommendations, a roadmap for the legislature to to use and guide. There's still going to have to be bills for any anything that we come up with for change that's going to come out of this. It's up to the legislature. We don't tell the legislator. We give them suggestions of what charitable gaming should look like. It's really up to the legislature to uh, to move act on those. All right. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.